Shares for beginners. Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorized reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. The key to successful investing or successful use of one of these newsletters, i.e. making money, is finding the one that, that fits with your type of personality, or more specifically, the way you think, the way your mind works. So what I mean by that is some people love storytelling. Some people love number crunching and analysis and deep thinking. Some people love pictures and graphs and they're, and they're a visual type thinker. So the great thing about the newsletter market in Australia is there's pretty much something for everyone. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. When you start delving into the world of investing, you quickly realise how many newsletters are available to help you choose stocks for your portfolio. But how do you find the one that's right for you? My guest today is doing the work so that you don't have to. Hello, Simon. Hi, Phil. How are you going? Simon Shepherd is Principal and Senior Partner at Providence Advisory. He's a financial advisor, planner and personal wealth coach to a wide variety of clients, including senior executives, self-employed professionals and self-funded retirees. He's also behind the Investment Newsletter Group, or TING. So tell us about TING. Where did the idea come from? What we found with you know the investment newsletter market in Australia is, I guess, we're really spoiled for choice. There's an abundance of products and services out there, all promising, all promising wonderful gains, aren't oh, they? That's exactly right. That's yeah. you know that's why that's why they're in business, of course. And you know, but backdrop for me is I've been a, a, a personal investor since I was 16 years old, and you know I love the data, I love the, the the stuff that's out there. But what I found when I started doing my homework was there was no way to really compare how they were doing you know you sort of subscribe or do a, a trial subscription on a, on a wing and a prayer and hope that what you buy goes up because um, you, you're just responding to the marketing really aren't you exactly whether you like the color scheme yeah or the, it's the way all that, that stuff they're talking. you know and that's yeah. fair enough that you know they're trying to attract subscribers and i guess stand out from their competitors etc so uh you know i started looking around to see if there was any tools or research portals that might cover specifically in this particular part of the investment market. So not managed funds, not ETFs, but you know, I'm an individual stock investor and I need some help. Where, where do I go? Which newsletter is the best for me? Um, so we started uh, building this research portal, which is called the Investment Newsletter Group, um, TING for short. And uh, what we then did was went out and built some virtual portfolios, basically. So we, you know, we pretended we had $120,000 to invest in, oh, I was um, going to ask for that. It's all paper trading, isn't all it? All paper it's not trading. Real, yeah, I do have money, money invested myself, but yeah, in terms yeah. of you know the cleanliness and the, and the data management, etc., we just thought you know let's start with what would possibly a typical portfolio size be for you know the average man or woman in the street getting started, etc. So seven portfolios across the seven newsletters that we selected to um, track mm. and see how they're doing. A variety of different styles, which we can jump into further down the chat. Yeah. Um, and uh, we've been doing that in, in one form or another since uh, 1st of July 2021. So coming up on two years, um, this is obviously a long-term, um, all being well, a long-term tool and analysis. But we thought, you know, now's a good time to launch and start talking about what we're doing and how we think we might be able to help the individual investor. So tell us about being 16 years old and starting investing. <laughs> I mean, are, are you unusual? <laughs> about to say. I don't know a lot of people no, that, exactly. that start investing at that and age. If, if you ask my parents about the uh, the BHP share price chart that I hand charted every single day on the back of my uh, my wardrobe, they'd have a good old chuckle. Oh, did um, you have graph paper and all of that? I had the works. <laughs> <laughs> the works. How did you work out the actual scale of it? Because did you get it wrong to start with? Uh, I, I, definitely the, uh, the rubber got plenty of use as well, so. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. It's all part of the process, I think. But yeah, but it's, it's actually really good to go through that kind of process, I think, um, because you actually see that the, the charts we get on screens now, which are all automatically generated, they're all based on graph paper. You know, you go back, you know, many years ago. I mean, some of the the, the earlier works on technical analysis were all done like that, hand drawn with pencil, paper, rubber on graph paper. So true. Yeah. So true. But so, what was it about that that attracted you? Well, I, I think um, getting the feel for it, how much a share price could move within a day, and BHP was an obvious candidate being yeah. you know, one of the largest stocks in the Aussie market, very high profile, still is, of course. 
but yeah, I'd get some funny looks from my mates when they'd come around and, you know, most of them have got um, whatever Stranger Things posters on them or whatever it was back then. You know, I I had a few skiing posters up there, but then I had this stonking big great BHP chart on the wall. Um, But that's how I got my interest going and it went from there. So obviously, as as you say, now with technology, nobody draws charts anymore. Mm. Likewise, Mm. any kind of analysis of companies, um, it's all electronic, it's all computed, it's so efficient. Yeah. It doesn't make it any easier as an investor, but um, at least that work's done for us, which mm. is what's great about what we've got on offer in Australia with some of these newsletters. So I guess it was obvious that you were going to end up in the financial services industry. One way or another, that was that was my path, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. Did you go to uni to did. Did you study what, yeah. economics, finance? Um, yeah, something? finance and accounting. So mm-hmm. um, again, back when, when everything was done on paper and, and very limited spreadsheets. But I actually started life as in the accounting field, one of the big four accounting firms as a cadet straight out of high school. They, if you want to be a, an accountant and that's your career thing, great. It didn't, for me, wasn't, you know, after a year or two, wasn't the right fit. But what was great about it was it got me in the workforce. They helped me out with my degree um, and I, I did a finance and accounting degree. About halfway through my degree, I, yeah, you know, with that, that urge to somehow get into the investment banking, financial market side of, of life, I actually made it at uni who was working at Bankers Trust, just got accepted into ANSET flight school as a pilot. And so he put his hand up on my behalf, said, I've got this great guy that is really keen to come and have a go. So ended up at Bankers Trust, which at the time in the sort of early to mid 90s was the, you know, sort of one of the top. Um, yeah, I've had, a, I've had a couple of guests on who talk about the 90s at Bankers right. Trust. Yeah. Beautiful. yeah, the good the, mm. the good days, good old days. And so that was my sort of foothold into, uh, you know, the finance world, financial market world. Mm. And from there, I ended up finishing my uh, degree. And the day after I finished my degree, I flew to Tokyo, uh, ironically, ostensibly to just have a year off, a gap year and um, teach English and, you know, backpack around and end up in London. But after about two months, I got very itchy feet and uh, got in touch with one of my clients from my BT days and uh, landed me a job on the desk at Lehman Brothers, which no longer exists. Um, uh, the notorious the, Lehman Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> one of the ones that blew up in the financial crisis. Um, mm. Wasn't around when that happened, thank goodness. Ended up in, yeah, in Tokyo for four years in a sales trading role, mainly for Deutsche Bank. And then they moved me to New York for two years. So, same thing over there. And then off to London for another sort of three years um, with a bit of time off in between and landed at a French bank. And then ended up back in Australia in the mid 2000s and had another sort of three, four years and working on trading desks um, and then joined the family business in mid 2008. So you're a planner and advisor now since yep, then? you yep. bet. So got my uh, got my license early 2009. So what am I, 14 years now? So roughly, I guess, half my working life, I've, I've been on sales trading desks, working in the markets, hmm. seeing how things, you know, really, I, I think that's probably a blessing for me as an advisor now, which a lot of advisors don't have. Not You know, every, everybody has their strengths and weaknesses, of course. Um, but to be able to understand what makes markets tick, how hard it is to to make money, you know, how, how hard it is to beat the market yeah. um, is, is was a brilliant experience. And so what I've tried to do is apply that to building Ting um, with my background and the, the analysis and, and the way of thinking about, you know, what is it that I'd be looking for if I was an investor trying to get started in, um, you know, in a newsletter, et, et cetera. It seems interesting that you're looking at newsletters. I mean, you do have a lot of experience in markets already. Why did you start looking at newsletters? I believe it's because many of your clients need this kind of assistance. Is that the case? Look, it's a bit of it's a bit of everything. It's it's partly personal interest. It's partly for those clients that you know like to do it together. So they might have a share portfolio, but they need us to help them with other parts of their financial world or lives. And it's also because I'm always looking for that edge, right? So I think that one of the most important things if you are doing your own investing is you've got to have a robust system. And there's no one size fits all, but you've got to have something that's repeatable, ideally successful over a market cycle. In other words, you know, beating the market. Otherwise, what's the point? You know, that can withstand the rigors of um, a bad patch, a downturn, a drawdown, a paper loss, whatever you want to call it. So let's see if these newsletters are, are, you know, cut the mustard. Because in a lot of cases, they display their returns, but there's very little clarity around exactly what method they use. There's no consistent approach. There's no industry rules or standards. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. So, you know, that's where I think an independent, unbiased analysis of the returns 
is, is really useful. It's not the be all and end all, but it's a starting point and an important one. Yeah, but when, and when you started researching this, you discovered Wall Street Survivor in the United right. States and um, uh, they've been a bit of an inspiration for they you. They have, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, you know, pretty, um, very been, been around a long time, very deep data set, seem to be, you know, very well resourced. Uh, you know, for me, this is more just a, it's a, it's the research arm of my of my mainline financial planning business. So we have limited resources at the moment, but the principle of what we're trying to do is is very similar to Wall Street Survivor. It's really helping self directed investors to you know make better decisions and and a, a selection tool for for the for newsletters. So when you started looking at newsletters, you're basically looking at the ones that provide fundamental research or technical analysis or combination of both so is there any criteria that you used in choosing which um look good question i think not implicitly what we've ended up with through our research is uh the seven newsletters that we track there's a real variety you could probably bucket them into a couple of main categories so there's some that are what we call sort of the value investing approach so you know we've all almost all heard of warren buffett i'm sure or benjamin graham who was the father of, of um the Messiah. The Messiah, Messiah indeed. Of, uh, indeed. <laughs> value investing. Exactly. Yeah. So there's, you know, some, some of the newsletters uh, apply that approach. Others would be what I call sort of a blend. So, you know, they, they do a, a value investing sort of overlay, but they might look for, you know, quality at a reasonable price without getting too technical. That generally means maybe something that's a bit more expensive by traditional value measures, but um, it's still a good quality company to own. And that's, again, sort of straying the way that Buffett or his disciples have moved towards, you know, not a strictly the cigar butt approach, for example, which you might have heard about, you know, the buying those cheapest, dirtiest stocks you can find in the hope that they turn around. So some fit in that category. Some use technical indicators as well to complement their, 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 their recommendations. So what I mean by that is um, a classic one is just charting the share price, like, you know, the BHP that, that we talked about before in the hope that that gives you an additional edge or allows you to maybe better time your entry and exit into an investment and and for risk management as well. So here's a point where if the stock gets here, for example, we recommend you sell it or lighten up. So without even looking at the fundamentals of the company at that point, it's just this is where the price is and this is where we should take action. So there's that bucket. And then the other bucket we noticed was what we call a sort of quantitative or data-based or evidence, but not evidence-based, but but a data heavy or data intensive um, approach. Um, So newsletters like Stockopedia, for example, um, Simply Wall Street, where they crunch a lot of data and come up with screenings and, and, you know, different filters. So you can pretty much cherry pick any theme that you wanted or um, build your own filters. These styles all work in different seasons, if you will, of the market. There's not really any right or wrong, you know, and that's why I think there's value in looking at as many as we can within the scope of what our resources are. So that, yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of different styles. Um, and it's kind of worked out well that we've ended up with different styles in the, in the reporting so far. What does it mean to have the best fit newsletter? Well, I think the way we look at it, it's really about, as we've just discussed, right, there's, there's a, a bunch of different um, investing styles. And, you know, as humans, we're not robots. We're all very unique. We all have um, a lot of subconscious biases and drivers and influences. And I think the key to successful investing or successful use of one of these newsletters, i.e. making money, is finding the one that, that fits with your type of personality or more specifically, your, the way you think, the way your mind works. Um, so what I mean by that is some people love storytelling. Um, some people love uh, number crunching and analysis and deep thinking. Some people love pictures and graphs and they're, and they're a visual type thinker. So the great thing about the newsletter market in Australia is there's pretty much something for everyone. So as opposed to one size fits all, it's really about figuring out the way you think, the kind of investment style that resonates with you and then giving it a try. And so what we've done in the newsletter, the report, is we broadly categorize each of the ones we follow into, into certain styles. And where that's also useful is if we're in a certain season of the market where maybe value is doing better than other approaches, it'd be interesting to see if the newsletters actually are consistent with you know what's happening in the broader market. Only time will tell, because obviously we're still fairly young in terms of the, the data history. And I think the reason why the, the best fit concept is so important is I can guarantee you that it will be tested. So what I mean by that is, 
any strategy, any personal individual investor, any fund manager, any professional investor for that matter, is, is always going to have a tough a tough period, mm. hopefully not too long. Um, <laughs> and then they get lucky sometimes That's right, as well. yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. And, you know, it reminds me of my old boss in the trading desk in Tokyo. He used to say, it's, it's, you know, it's better to be lucky than smart. <laughs> um, because if you're smart, if you're lucky, but you think you're smart, you can actually get yourself in a lot of trouble, mm. which is, a, you know, it's a, it's a great thing to keep in mind. And again, that, it gets back to why, um, you know, process is so important because we're, we're the enemies of our own emotions, not just with investing, but everything in life. And it's a tough job, you know, the investing piece, it really is. You're competing against some of the smartest people in the world with, you know, instantaneous access to, 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 to um, exchanges. I can't remember what that movie was, but a few years ago, you know, all these hedge funds were competing to build their office as close to the exchange as possible yes. with the fastest fiber optic cables and you know paying exorbitant rents to do it so that they could get a just to a, save a few nanoseconds that's right exactly the, it's an yeah. ama- amazing movie mm. um so you know you've you, you, obviously we can't compete with that as as individual investors but it doesn't mean there's not an opportunity right and that's why it gets back to really finding the approach that works for you because when it's tested in other words when you hit a rough patch with your portfolio you need to be able to stick it out because the worst thing you can do is abandon the strategy and human nature is you abandon at the worst point possible. Mm. Guarantee the next day the market will turn if you if you sell out, go into cash. Yeah, those people and in the middle of the GFC just this, said, I can't take it anymore. That's just right, and it happens, you yeah. know. Um, and that's where, you know, it's, it can be a really lonely existence and that's where you've got to be able to lean back on one of two things. One is that the process does work over time. So rely and trust in that newsletter that they're going to do the right thing by you. Once you've done your initial homework, right, and you've figured out which one works for you or you've, you know, get, get our quarterly newsletter and track how things are going, whatever it is, whatever you do or get advice. So that's one of two. And two of two is in, in many cases, it's great to have a coach or, a, you know, someone you can talk to because it can be a really lonely existence. Hmm. Even if you're doing well, it's like, well, when do I take profits? You know, I made all this money, I've quintupled or, you know, a 10 bagger, five bagger. Who's going to help you risk manage that? Who's going to help you rebalance? So, but putting that aside, because the whole point of a newsletter is doing it yourself um, as a starting point is, is really, you've got to make sure that you're comfortable with it because you're going to be pushed and challenged when you're losing money. Super is one of the most important investments you'll ever make. But how do you know if you're in the best fund for your situation? Head to lifesherpa.com.au to find out more. Life Sherpa, Australia's most affordable online financial advice. Is it important as well to be newsletters to be upfront about their failures as well as their successes? And do they do that? It's fairly transparent from what we've seen with our research. But again, it depends on the style, right? So the more traditional kind of, you know, when I say traditional, I mean like a, uh, if you've ever read a stockbroker's report. So, you know, let's just, I don't know, pick on CBA. You know, here's the recent story. And I guess CBA is very relevant because they just reported a, a record profit yesterday. Um, <laughs> and dropped <laughs> in price very quickly. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Not, not that we're interested in those daily movements. No, in indeed, <laughs> that's exactly right. If you mm-hmm. Don't talk to us if that's what you're looking for. In terms of, you know, your question about do they own up to their failures? Yeah. I think it's easy to figure that out with the more traditional newsletters. And, you know, most of them, when I, so for example, Intelligent Investor, the traditional style is what I mean. So, you know, like a stockbroking report, they'll write a report, they'll have a valuation on the stock, they'll have an action to take, so on and so forth. If that doesn't work out, it's pretty clear to see, and they generally do disclose it. You know, they're upfront about that. So I think that's good. There's, you know, there's nothing in our research universe that concerns us. There's none in our list that, You know, yes, we have to rank them, but it's only one measure of uh, quality, if you will, or performance. It's only one thing in the data set that you should be looking at. As I I keep saying, equally important is the... um, the style has to has to suit you because if you pick you know you pick the best performing newsletter for example um, but it's not really the way you think and the way your mind works the second it has a downturn the risk is that you walk away from it and you've got to start again and most likely you've destroyed some capital along the way so we hope that the tool helps people get get it right the first time and avoid those kind of mistakes one of the things i've found in my own investing that i've learned so much about is the importance of journaling and writing down why you took a particular position and to look back on it when it goes wrong. 
And I think with a newsletter, you can actually refer back to the newsletter. All of that information is there for you. Just copy and paste it into your journal. And so you can look back at that. Um, journaling is very hard. And it's also very hard when you're making your own decisions as well. Do you find that can be a big part of the guidance that you need as an individual retail investor? Look, it's, um, it's a really great and, uh, and unique question because I haven't seen anything and it may exist, but I haven't seen it out there that sort of um, encourages that. Some of the services have great educational tabs and there's probably stuff in, the, in buried in there about, you know, holding yourself accountable, benchmarking yourself. That's sort of an extension of what you're saying. So I think it's beneficial. However, in my experience as an advisor and observing, you know, trading desks and stockbroking, we, you know, our business was at, at Morgan's Financial for about five years. So I, I'd sit next to stockbrokers on the phone all day long to you know those self-directed investors or self-managed super fund clients that want to do their own investing i didn't see a lot of introspection i didn't see a lot of reflection it's like if you lose money move on go to the next thing so i think there's value in that whether or not many people do it i'm not sure the only area i'm aware of that it's really an enforced discipline is if you're day trading or you're trading some kind of system and you know you, you're doing it for a full-time job. It's it's a it's a dedication. It's a discipline. It's this is this is it. This is what I'm doing for my for my living. In in that case, I'm I, I know it's pretty common. But you know, for for the mum and dad investors, and if you've got a day job and kids to raise and all that stuff, I, I can't imagine it happens too often. But I think it's a great idea. But a softer version of that would be benchmarking. And when clients come to see me, and you know they're talking up their investment prowess or down, in, in which case they want to come and outsource. You know, the first thing I say is what are you benchmarking yourselves to or the opposite you know sometimes when clients say look i think i can do a better job myself or my kids want to take it over or i'm getting too old you know there's it's a free world right where we, we try to um, help as many people as we can in a way that works for them mm. but the number one thing i say is be honest with yourself and at least benchmark yourself and that's where something like share site is great um, which we use in our uh, data analysis because it allows you to do that and that's the the, the rawest form of truth possible because if you're not going to beat the market why bother, right? If it's a hobby and it's fun, go play golf. Yeah. You know, and just it's a lot cheaper. In, into That's an right. Index hugging ETF. Whatever it is, right? Some index fund, yeah. Some passive approach, indexing, mm -hmm. or you know, or pick a manager you like, whatever. But it's, I think if we did more of that probably if we did more of that there'd be less people trying to do their own thing actually so <laughs> maybe that's counterintuitive for the newsletter industry who knows <laughs> so I'm, I'm slightly scared having you here because um many of the newsletters you cover i've had um some of the people that work for them sure. on this podcast as well yeah and we love them all <laughs> indeed they all provide a service yeah just give us some general overview of the observations that you've come up with out of this process um look uh, yeah i think it's it's really exciting Phil, it's really exciting. And I, I am such an investment nerd. Hmm. As I said, interview any of my schoolmates and they'll tell you that or my family. <laughs> but it's, you know, there's no... Um, and look, another way, if you look at it from a commercial point of view, all the newsletters we're looking at have been going concerns for a long time. I think in some cases, like 30 years, I think the um, Eureka Report, Intelligent Investor, they've had various um, corporate restructures over time and changed brands, whatever. So... As a starting point, you know, by definition, if these guys are in business and selling newsletters, they must be doing something right. The purpose in what we're doing is just helping people filter out the noise to screen, to find something that suits them best. Nothing on our list is of any concern or we wouldn't, we wouldn't bother having it on the list, but they're all different. Our role is to help people try and understand that. It's a bit like, you know, our, our sort of full service financial planning clients. We spend a lot of time getting to know them so that we can try and customize the advice and the strategy so that it, it most resonates with them because we want happy clients, we want success. So in the same way, hopefully Ting over time will do that as well or be one of those tools that people can use. But in, in summary, we're blessed, right? We're so blessed. We, there's so many, and we're, we're only scratching the surface. There's probably another five or six I could roll off that I'd love to be tracking as well. Um, it's just at this point, resources and costs and everything else. So we, you know, we try to sort of work our way through that. But again, you, let's jump back in that time machine to the 80s. Um, you know, you just didn't have the power and the data that you have now at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. So all that work is done for you. How exciting and how good is that? That means you're just ready to go. It doesn't mean it makes investing easier, but it just, there's all that energy you've saved because of um, technology basically. And because, you know, there's, there's a lot of great services out there. Just the trick is the first step is which one's the right one for me. 
presumably this is a useful tool to find that. Well, I'd like to think so, yeah. but you know, welcome the feedback from your listeners and mm-hmm. um, you know anyone who wants to jump on and it's a free report, download it. We've got fresh data from a couple of days ago. You know, have a look and we welcome feedback. Um, subscribe to our quarterly updates and yeah, you know, we we want to be encouraged by the crowd to 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 do things and the more support we get, the more we can put into the the service. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. A newsletter is often simply a guide. The individual investor still needs to drive the car with skill, knowing when to buy and sell, knowing when to cut losses and let winners run. How do newsletters compare in this department? For the most part, they cover it well. And I call that, again, risk management or rebalancing, um, you know, money management to different terms, but they all mean the same thing, which is really, you know, like you say, what, when do you get out of something that's not working or when you take, you know, some, some nice profits off the table, good problem to have. Because, because the thing is, if it's not working, that's where you've got to cut your losses, don't you? That's, you've got to really cut your losses. That's the, the most important thing, isn't it? It is. And again, mm-hmm. another quote from an, another um, trading desk boss was, you know, the, the first cut is the cheapest. So, you know, you ride it longer and longer, it goes lower and lower, and eventually... Oh, that's going on my list of sayings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's, again, it's so true. Um, and, you know, we're, looking, we're talking about trading desks here, but, the, but many of the analogies apply for the individual as well. Not that, you know, we're in the business of, of turning over our entire portfolio in the course of a week, but you're going to be challenged with those decisions at some point. So again, most of the newsletters, they have valuation ranges or they have, um, in some cases, they have sort of hard, what they call a stop loss, which is a point at which the stock gets to and you're losing money at that point. No, no questions asked, you sell it. You don't try and second guess the market. You ch- don't try and look for some glimmer of hope in the latest you know, AFR article about the dog that's going to recover. You just exit. So again, it comes down to style, right? Some people might be very comfortable with that, just rip the Band-Aid off, and some people won't. So they approach it differently. But in all styles of the newsletters we cover, there is some form of what I would call risk management, you know, when to take profits, when to cut your losses. The exception would be the quantitative style of newsletter. So the two in our universe are Stockopedia and Simply Wall Street. And really then it's not so much a hard get out or, or, you know, get out, you're losing money or get out, you're taking profits. It's at the discretion of the individual investor as to when they should do it. So again, it depends on your personality, right? Whether you've got the discipline and my advice would be if you go into something, one of those services and you set up a position, have your exit strategy in mind already in both directions. Um, And there's plenty of trading books around that and investing books, you know, it's not, not for today's chat, but that way you've had the conversation with yourself before the event and before the emotions take over. Um, either greed or fear, right? It goes both ways. Really for those kind of services, and again, there's others, others out there that we don't cover, but they still have very powerful uh, signals, messaging, whatever you want to call it, that will, you know, you can, you can set that up and go, okay, but it's, for example, Stockopedia have a, you know, they have a ranking, a scoring system. So 100s, the stocks you really want to own, zeros, don't go near it, it's nuclear waste and so on and so forth. So you might set a score of 95. If, if the score drops below 95, I'm going to sell it, no questions asked. And in fact, that's what we use as an example for our, um, our virtual portfolio, the Stockopedia ones. We, we, our universe is the top 5%. So that's what we're always owning and holding when we do our rebalances of our Stockopedia portfolio. So that's one example. You might say, yep, 95 is my get out. You know, if, if, if the score drops below there, I'll sell it and I'll buy the, the newest thing that's on their list that's ranked 100. So that's actually the process that we do with our Stockopedia virtual portfolio. So it's a rules-based mechanical process. So as long as you're okay, again, that type of personality that you can build rules and stick with them, then that's, in our opinion, how you would use something like a, a Simply Wall Street or a Stockopedia for that risk management aspect. So then is that framework that you just described does that change from newsletter to newsletter depending Absolutely. on the stuff it would have yeah. to wouldn't it because yeah, yeah they're going to have different rankings exactly systems. right yeah it's, it's so true so they'll so be very difficult i feel to yeah, compare them it is and that's mm. where we've had to do some work and some thinking and it's been it's been great and challenging at the same time and again i think i've been fortunate because i've i've worked on trading desks and you know sat in front of bloomberg screens for 15 years and i'm not you know i don't i don't rank myself a mathematician by any stretch but good enough to hopefully produce something that's of value for our subscribers and what we've tried to do is just you know replicate what a typical journey might be for someone starting out in investing or starting out with this newsletter 
That's why we don't cover every single stock that's a buy, right? Because in reality, you wouldn't own every single stock in no. most cases. Mm. So, you know, we, we have to sort of finesse that in a certain way with each portfolio. And again, you know, we're happy to publish the rules um, in due course. You know, we, we can get all that stuff on the website. So absolutely, they all speak sort of a different language, if you will. They all have a different style. And, you know, I can s- strongly recommend they all offer, you know, try before you buy free trials, right? So absolutely, if any of them sound interesting, even, you know, not necessarily the ones that are ranked one or two on our list, go ahead and look at them and, and, and you know, play around with them. But before you do, I'd strongly urge you to think about, you know, what is it you want to achieve? Is it short term? Is it long term? Is it, you know, are you only looking at exchange traded funds? Is it single stocks? Predominantly, these guys are, you know, a, sing- a single stock focus, in, in other words, an individual company. You know, so what we've tried to do is standardize, like I said at the start of our chat, the challenge with the ones that do report their returns is you, you've got no idea what their methodology is. There's, there's no unified approach yeah, therefore it's not, it's not a level playing field exactly and yeah. maybe not a negative there may be good reason for that yeah. right because how do you define a return is it stocks they still own is it stocks they own before they all do their best to report some degree again apart from the quant style ones because there's just too many right so um and, and the quant style so the stockopedias and the um uh simply wall street they make it very clear that it's not necessarily a buy or sell recommendation it's 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 a screening tool it's a you know it's a data set Mm. so i think um again it comes down to awareness what works for you you know what you're trying to achieve and the way you think the way you look at the world like i said before do you like do you like stories um in which case you know things like storytelling and, and ideas and um, you know things like intelligent investor fat profits motley full you know they're more your traditional kind of stockbroker type approach and you know if you're a visual person then you've got the snowflakes with uh, with simply wall street um, so there is something for everyone really and it's just about uh, as i said um, you know jump on and, and do the free trials they all they all do good things it's just they don't all hum at the same time which is what's what our numbers are demonstrating so far so what we've tried to do is take a unified approach there's slightly different portfolio construction for each portfolio because of those things you point out they all have you know one man's buy is another man's hold or you know dif- different definitions so we're trying to unify as best we can but we have you know a very clear set of data uh, portfolio construction rules for every single portfolio. So, you know, and it's all open. If anyone ever wants to look at it, we can say this is how we did. And I've given you an example for Stockopedia. Um, and we use ShareSite, which is a fantastic, uh, you know, tracking service. And benchmark, benchmark, benchmark. <laughs> exactly right. That's what it's all about. Otherwise, why are we here, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't want to lose money for, for fun. I'd rather play golf and get frustrated that way. So, <laughs> yeah. So um, where can listeners find out more? Pretty straightforward. We've got a website, tinglive.com.au. So the Ting stands for the Investment Newsletter Group. We've got a free report you can download. As I said, fresh off the press is the latest performance data. You know, go ahead and subscribe for our quarterly updates. And, you know, as I said, over time, if the demand is there and we get support, we're going to expand. We've got a, a bunch of ideas of different products and, you know, um, tools, etc. But we just really, you know, see, see, see what people think of what we're doing so far and go from there. Any socials? Uh, no. <laughs> a bit old school <laughs> that way, but thank you for asking. <laughs> no worries. Just that's, making sure we cover two. everything. Yes, space two. Simon Shepherd, thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Phil. Good to talk to you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening to Shares for Beginners. You can find more at sharesforbeginners.com. If you enjoy listening, please take a moment to rate or review in your podcast player or tell a friend who might want to learn more about investing for their future.